Good evening and welcome to Skullnet 7. My name is Patrick Witkowski and I am joined today by the Gordon SNP MP Richard Thompson, who is also the shadow spokesperson for the for international trade, Northern Ireland and Wales. Hello. Good evening. We'll be starting with the Ukraine update, day 763 of the conflict. Ukraine's navy claims it has sunk or disabled a third of all Russian warships in the Black Sea in just over two years of war. Dmitry Platenchuk from the Navy said the latest strike on Saturday night hit the Russian amphibious landing ship Kostyantin Olshansky, which was resting in dock in Sevastopol in Russia-occupied Crimea, before being captured by Russia in 2014. Platenchuk previously announced that two other landing ships of the same type Azov and Yamal also were damaged in Saturday's strike along with Ivan Kur's intelligence ship. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has replaced the Secretary of Ukraine's National Security Council, Oleksiy Danilov, with Alexander uh, Levit, uh, Litvinenko, 50, uh, 51 years old, head of the Foreign Intelligence Service. Danilov had the Secretary of the Council since October 2019. Zelensky said Danilov was being transferred to new duties, with details to be made public later. Ukraine has staged further air attacks on Belgorod, just over the border inside Russia. NATO is considering shooting down Russian missiles that stray too close to its borders. Poland's Deputy Foreign Minister, Andrzej Zenia, has told Polish media outlet RMF24. Poland's armed forces said Russia violated Poland's airspace on Sunday, uh, Sunday morning with a cruise missile launched at targets in western Ukraine. Ukraine's government is flooding uh, money into its defense industry, budgeting nearly $1.4 billion in 2024 to develop weapons at home, 20 times more than before Russia's full-scale invasion, the Associated Press has reported. A huge portion of weapons are being bought from privately owned factories sprouting up across the country, such as a mortar factory in western Ukraine making roughly 20,000 shells a month. To help with labor shortages, the government has ex exempted defense industry workers from military service. Compared with last year, Ukraine's output of mortar shells is about 40 times higher, and its production of ammunition for artillery has nearly tripled said Oleksandr Kamishin, Ukraine's Minister of Strategic Industries. There has also been a boom in drone startups, with the government uh, committing roughly $1 billion on top of its defense budget. There are about 200 companies in Ukraine now focused on drones, delivering 50 times more of them in December compared with a year earlier. According to Mikhailo Fedorov, the Minister of Digital Transformation, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian-made sea drones have proven to be an effective weapon against the Russian fleet in the Black Sea. Ukraine's surge in military spending has, occur, uh, has occurred against a backdrop of $60 billion in U.S. aid being held up by Congress, and with European countries struggling to deliver enough ammunition. Ukrainian security officers arrested two people suspected of acting on behalf of Russia as they tried to blow up a railway line used to supply weapons to the front. In Kharkiv and parts of the southeastern Zaporizhia region, 200,000 people remained without electricity after last Friday's attack on the country's energy infrastructure. Emergency power outages have also reportedly been introduced in Ukraine's Black Sea port city of Odessa. Russia is trying to expand its forces to uh, in its own northwest. The UK Ministry of Defense has said in an update, adding that most of Russia's troops remain dedicated to fighting in Ukraine. Now, Richard, um, what kind of comment do you have on the ongoing Ukraine situation? Uh, well, it's uh, very depressing that we're still... Uh in a situation of talking about it and talking about it in the context of stalemate. Um, I mean, there are uh, a number of military successes that the Ukrainians can point to. You said yourself in your introduction, the claims that they have uh, uh, destroyed around one third of the, the Russian Black Sea fleet. Now, uh, for a country without any 
naval forces of its own to speak of. That's quite the the achievement, and it, it shows the the asymmetric nature, I think, of war. That uh, so much of that uh, destructive capacity has been carried out by uh, drones, but uh, also by the uh, by cruise missiles uh, produced in, in Europe, such as a Storm Shadow that have been uh, sent by the. By, by the UK, but um, I think what really comes home for me is the the real nature of the stalemate here is because of the shortage of ammunition. Now, I think there's a few reasons for that. Um, obviously, there's the, the current blockages in, uh, on Capitol Hill in terms of uh, further uh, military aid, uh, but also um, Western Europe's industries are not on a, a war footing or even a, a proxy war footing. And um, it was something that was rammed home to me forcibly uh, in a visit to Estonia a few months ago where I was part of a UK Parliament delegation. We met the their Defence Committee in Parliament and the Foreign Affairs Committee and the single biggest thing that they were pointing to in terms of what would really shift the dynamic of the conflict was uh, ammunition, making sure that enough ammunition was getting to the, uh, the front line to allow the Ukrainians to hold what they had recaptured captured and also to continue on their offensive. And uh, I don't think that's a message that's been heard loudly enough in the, enough Western capitals, frankly. But uh, also, um, one thing that I think Broadcasting Scotland can take enormous credit for is in terms of the editorial values that keep the Ukrainian conflict at the forefront. Obviously, there's another conflict in, in Gaza, which is utterly horrific when we see the loss of uh, human life there and the many issues that, that swirl around there. And uh, I think there is a danger that... Uh, for all the, the importance of what's happening in Gaza, it's right that that should be at the forefront of our minds. We can't forget the conflict that is happening in Ukraine because uh, if Russia prevails there, very soon it will also be our conflict in Western Europe too. And now potentially spurring more praise from you, we will be moving on to our, uh, uh, our latest of the Israel-Gaza situation. At least 32,490 Palestinians have been killed and 74,889 have been injured in Israeli strikes on Gaza since the 7th of October, according to the latest figures from the Gaza Health Ministry. The sovereign Gaza Strip came under intense Israeli bombardment overnight, despite international pressure for an immediate ceasefire in the Palestinian territory where famine is looming. 11 Palestinian civilians were killed and others were injured in an Israeli airstrike targeting a house of a Deir family in the south of Rafah today. In the city of Rafah today, sorry. Um, according to Palestinian news agency Wafa. Wafa also reported that two people were critically injured when Israeli tanks opened a barrage of gunfire towards a group of civilians waiting for humanitarian aid near the Kuwait round, uh, roundabout area in Gaza City. Israeli forces surrounded two hospitals in Khan Yunus, where the health ministry said 12 people, including some children, were killed in an Israeli strike on a camp for the, uh, for the displaced. The Palestinian Red Crescent Society, PRCS, warned that thousands were trapped in the Nassar Hospital in Khan Yunus and said their lives are in danger. The PRCS also said that the Al Amal uh, hospital in Khan Yunus was taken out of service after Israeli military forces and hospitals crews and the wounded had to, uh, had to evacuate it and closed its entrances with dirt barriers. Israeli Defense Minister Yav Gallant said he told the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken that only a decisive victory will bring to an end of uh, will bring an end of this war. Hamas has asked donor countries to stop their airdrops after 12 people drowned trying to recover parachuted food aid from the sea off Gaza's Mediterranean coast. Hamas and Swiss-based Euromed uh, Human Rights Monitor also said another six people were killed in stampedes trying to get to aid. The Israeli Prime Minister's handling of relations with the Biden administration, which led the US on Monday to decline to veto a ceasefire resolution at the UN Secu uh, Security Council, has been greeted by sharp criticism by Israeli commentators. Three Palestinians were killed during an arrest raid in Jenin overnight and Wednesday morning, according to the Times of Israel. According to the report, the IDF said it carried out a drone strike in the occupied West Bank city, killing two Palestinian gunmen. Israel is prepared for a Rafah ground operation in mid-April or early May, according to Meta report. 
A spokesperson for the UN Child Welfare Agency warned on Tuesday that the mental suffering of Gaza's children is so deep that some hope to die quickly to escape the nightmare. Parliamentary pressure is building on, UK on the UK government to ban arms sales to Israel after a letter signed by 134 MPs and Lords has uh, been sent to Foreign Secretary David Cameron to immediately suspend export licenses for arms transfers to Israel. The UK government is facing legal action over its pause to funding for UNRWA. Richard, uh, before I ask you for an overall statement on how you feel of the Israel situation, taking a look specifically at these letters being signed uh, to the Foreign Secretary David Cameron, we're currently at 134 as uh, letters, as reported in the report. At what point does it become an uh, unignorable demand for the Foreign Secretary? Well, I think anything is always ignorable for a Foreign Secretary that, that, that feels... Uh, secure in his uh, position. Look, I've added my name to letters uh, to the Foreign Secretary in recent days urging uh, uh, an arms embargo on, on, on Israel and to, to keep the pressure on. Um, I think it's, it's very, very clear that uh, a long time ago uh, the response of the Israeli government went far, far beyond anything that could even loosely be described as uh, self-defence. And uh, I think you saw with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu um, is tantrum over the fact that the United States refused to veto a, led, uh, a resolution at the United Nations Security Council uh, calling for a, an immediate ceasefire. Um, he clearly, Mr. Netanyahu, clearly uh, believes that he is as good as untouchable. Now, I see today he's um, backtracking the, the, the meeting that he'd previously called off uh, with the uh, the US, he, he he now wants to to proceed. Um, I suppose that's that's good, uh, but I think the only thing that can be done to bring the the Netanyahu government to heel, and let's not forget there's significant opposition to that government within Israel itself. But I think the only thing that can do to bring Netanyahu to and his government to heel is for the is to have the prospect of the of there no longer being arms exports and military aid to Israel to uh, to force uh, that immediate ceasefire to allow the humanitarian need to get in in the quantities that it needs to, and in the with the degree of safety that needs to. I mean, the, we shouldn't be airdropping aid, and it's just piles tragedy on tragedy that people have drowned um, trying to retrieve aid, uh, which should have been going to, to feed their families, which should have been able to get in unimpeded. So uh, I think we are long, long past any um, justification for what is going on. And uh, I think that uh, the, the international community speaks with as much of a, a single voice as possible here and uh, pressurise the Israeli government to bring this operation to an end now. Thank you. Shifting our focus over to the UK, Lord Mendelssohn dismisses prospect of UK rejoining EU under Labour. Lord uh, Peter Mendelssohn has dismissed the prospect of an incoming Labour government taking Britain back into the EU, saying, you've got to be joking, that Brussels would want to renegotiate the UK's membership. The Labour peer, a, a former EU trade commissioner and close advisor to Sir Keir Starmer, told the British Chambers of Commerce that rejoining the 27-country bloc would require a referendum that voters had little desire for. It has also been reported that Sir Keir Starmer has shelved Labour's plans to renegotiate the Brexit deal if he wins the general election. The SNOP said that this was yet another... in. Of the SNP uh, said that this was yet another in a series of turns by Sir Keir Starmer, who had originally backed the UK, uh, the UK remaining in the EU, EU, and promised to renegotiate the deal in 2019 after criticising it be it for uh, for being far too thin. Commenting, the SNP's Europe and EU accession spokesperson, Alan Smith MP, said. Brexit, imposed on us by both the Tories and Labour, who carelessly disregarded our views, has been an unmitigated disaster for Scotland, hammering Scottish industries and household budgets. Labour can't claim to be an alternative or an opposition to the Tories while championing the policies they brought in, especially when they are so toothless in opposition on the, on the very slim number of policies they do claim to disagree on. 
Here Starmer promised he would renegotiate this bad deal, but with fervor, uh, with this fervor U-turn, uh, he is making clear once again how untrustworthy the unprincip and unprincipled he is. Scotland needs representatives who aren't afraid to call for Brexit, for, uh, to call out Brexit for the disaster it has been, and who will continue to lead the opposition to Scotland's removal from the EU. Only a vote for the SNP at the next general election can secure that end quote. Richard, as somebody who deals with international trade, um, just how laughable is the concept that the EU would consider renegotiating the Brexit deal? Um, I think there's a few things to unpack here. There are always different variations that uh, could be on offer uh, in terms of what uh, the, the, the future relationship between the UK and the EU looks like. But uh, one thing area where I think Lord Mandelson is sadly correct is that there would be no appetite on the part of the EU to let the UK back in at present. And it's not because they wouldn't want things to go back to how they were if that was possible, but simply there's a real lack of trust in UK politicians and institutions, and uh, I think they would really need to see a, a, a decisive uh, show of public opinion uh, in a referendum to come back in. So I think that there's a, a great deal of fatigue in UK politics around about this, uh, so the, there are a number of political hurdles, even with the best will in the world to the UK as a single entity getting back in. Um, that's not to say other things can't be done, like uh, having a sanitary and phytosanitary deal, which would reduce border checks to absolutely negligible proportions in terms of uh, food and drink exports, which would be a huge benefit to, to Scotland. It's not to say that deals couldn't be done round about the single market. But I think last... Oh, we seem to be having a technical error. Uh, we will uh, give Richard a few moments to reconnect. Um, and in the meantime, we will proceed on to the next story and maybe go back to get his answer on this uh, right after. Um, our next story is an IPR report that warns that AI could lead to loss of almost 8 million jobs in the UK. Almost 8 million UK jobs. Uh, the, oh, did I say the, I, uh, that's the IPPR. Uh, report. Almost 8 million UK jobs could be lost to artificial intelligence in a jobs apocalypse, quote, according to a report by the Institute for Public Policy Research, the IPPR, warning that women, younger workers, and those on lower wages are at most risk from automation. The IPPR said that entry-level, part-time, and in-administrative jobs were most exposed to being replaced by AI under a worst-case scenario for the rollout of new technologies in the next three to five years. The think tank warned that the UK was facing a sliding door uh, moment as... Um, uh, is that our guest back? Sorry. Um, I was facing a sliding... Yeah. Great. Um, a sliding doors moment as growing numbers of companies adopt generative AI technologies, which can read and create text, data, and software code to automate everyday workplace tasks. The report said this first wave of AI adoption was already putting jobs at risk as growing numbers of companies introduce the technology. However, a second wave could lead to the automation of more jobs amid rapid advances in AI. Analyzing 22,000 tasks in the economy covering every type of job, the IPPR said 11% of tasks currently done by workers were at risk. This could, uh, though, increase to 59% of tasks in the second wave as technologies develop to handle increasingly complex processes. It said routine cognitive tasks, including database management, scheduling, and stock taking, were already at risk, with potential to displace entry-level and part-time jobs in secretarial work, administration, and customer services. The second wave of AI adoption could impact non-routine tasks involving the creation of databases, copywriting, and graphic design, which would affect increasing, increasingly higher-earning jobs. 
women would be significantly more affected, as they are more likely to work in the most exposed occupations, such as secretarial and administrative, uh, administrative occupations, the IPPR said. In the worst-case scenario for the second wave of AI, 7.9 million jobs could be displaced. The report said, with any gains for the economy for, uh, from productivity improvements being cancelled out with zero growth in GDP within three to five years. In a base case scenario for a full augmentation of a workforce uh, with generative AI, no jobs would be lost, while the size of the economy could be increased by 4%, or about £62 billion a year. Sounding the alarm over the impact on workers, the left-of-center think tank said government action could prevent a jobs apocalypse and help to harness the power of AI to boost economic growth and raise living standards. Going back to the previous story, Richard, um, I wanted you to finish off your point and also I wanted to further ask, since you're also a uh, um, Northern Ireland uh, spokesperson, uh, just how different the um, the prospects for a, a market are when they have access to the EU market and when they don't. So continue the answer if you remember where you left off. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks, Patrick. I'm not quite sure where I got uh, cut off by my technology falling over on me. But uh, no, I mean, Northern Ireland, you're right to point out, has got uh, a very special situation now. It has unfettered access to the European single market and it also has uh, some it also has a greatly more smoothed access to the UK market than was the case prior to the Windsor framework being agreed. So in many respects, Northern Ireland has the best of all worlds. That's a point Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, wasn't slow to make, um, conveniently oblivious to the fact that that was a situation that we all, of course, used to have before Brexit. So um, I think I was just coming to a conclusion on my point that it's probably going to be very difficult for the UK to go back into the European Union anytime soon because there's a lack of trust in politicians and in UK public opinion. That's not to say that other uh, uh, other versions of an arrangement with Europe aren't possible in terms of what trade and freedoms look like there. But I think it also shows how weak need uh, Keir Starmer is. He's not trying, even trying to change the political weather here. He's basically looking for Labour to win by making them like a more slightly more competent version of the Conservatives. Now, the I think this is a, a moment of opportunity because of that uh, political weakness on the part of Keir Starmer for uh, those who would like to see Scottish independence. Because I, I don't think the UK will go back into the European Union unless there's a, a very material change in circumstances and opinion. But, and I don't think the EU would accept Britain back in unless they could see that change of heart. Uh, what would, of course, be a very material change in circumstances and change of heart is if Scotland were to be able to vote for independence, because I think that would be a, a very, very clear vote of confidence, not just in Scotland becoming self-evidently an independent nation, but also if that independent nation were to determine that it wished to join the European Union, I think we'd be welcomed now with uh, very, very open arms. And uh, <clears throat> certainly I think there's a, a far stronger prospect of a, an independent Scotland being welcomed to the European Union in the next few years than there is uh, a, a UK that uh, has uh, come to its senses over what a, a catastrophic error Brexit was. So um, I would draw a line under that there and leave that thought hanging. Um, in terms of, uh, I heard you when I rejoined talking about artificial intelligence, I think um, it has a potential to be a real disruptive force in the economy. Um, it will change the nature of jobs. It can take some routine and laborious tasks and perhaps automate them, but it does put jobs at risk. And I think that there's a very, very real danger that, uh, particularly in the creative side of the economy, the AI uh, does not allow for people to be credited with thoughts and ideas and adequately recompensed for what they're doing. I think there's a real danger that AI companies will end up uh, effectively plagiarizing and 
breaching the copyright and the the, the, the rights of people to their their work without compensating them while trying to while these AI companies potentially get very rich themselves. I think there's also a real danger that the algorithms will simply embed existing inequalities in the in the workplace and uh, particularly in terms of of the way that they are adopted, but also where they're required to take decisions. And I think that it's very, very important that uh, whatever artificial intelligence can do, that there's real human intelligence and a real human heart, which is overseeing uh, decisions are taken uh, by, and that AI should only ever be a tool for humanity rather than the bulk of humanity becoming a tool for those who who stand to profit or enrich themselves out of uh, AI. Um, I'm not satisfied at all that governments have got the regulation right on this or yet that they are even talking about some of the right things that are anywhere close to the solutions that we uh, need um, or that there's any or that we're as near as we need to be in some terms of an international consensus on how AI is deployed but it, it could be very disruptive and destructive and uh, not necessarily in a way that uh, that improves the lives of the, the majority of people, which is what it should be there to do. And as I say, be the tool of humanity rather than right. making humanity its tool. And uh, we do have to move on to the next story soon, but I was wondering if there were any uh, policies that you heard brought up that you consider interesting or any think tanks or speakers that you think might have the finger on the pulse of this, this issue and might be saying things that you consider important. I'll highlight one in particular, and it's not normally regarded as a think tank, but the the TUC, the Trade Union Congress uh, in England, um, they published a pamphlet last year, um, about 30-odd pages, if I remember rightly, on the impact of artificial intelligence in the workplace. And it's technology neutral, but it does highlight the potential human impact of the use of AI in the workplace and emphasises the the need to uh, uphold workers' rights, to uphold pay and conditions, and to for people to be treated with respect and dignity. And uh, I think that uh, it took a very, very clear-sighted view of the opportunities and also the potential dangers of the widespread adoption of AI through industry in the workplace. And uh, I would thoroughly recommend it to anyone who's potentially affected by it, which is all of us, theoretically, uh, but also to uh, employers and those who make investment decisions, because uh, it really does encapsulate very well uh, the, the, the the landscape that, uh, that can result from AI and uh, all the, the moral issues that are there, which often get looked over, and, and the human issues, which often get locked over, looked over, in terms of the the excitement of what is technologically possible. Thank you for our next story. Visit Scotland is to close a network of information centres. Visit Scotland will close its uh, network of information centres over the next two years as part of a strategy designed to grow the visitor economy by influencing visitors in the planning stage of their trip before they leave home. It follows significant changes to the way people plan their holidays with most using online resources and travel specialists to research and book all aspects of their trips. This includes arranging accommodation and activities before they arrive at their destination. To adapt to the shift in behaviour, Visit Scotland says it will invest its resources and expertise in a digital first strategy. It will target channels it knows visitors use to inspire and influence where visitors go, when they come and what they do, including promoting lesser known destinations and quieter times of year. They say this new approach will help to uh, help the National Tourism Organization to deliver its core purpose to drive the visitor economy and grow its value to Scotland by reaching more people and influencing visitors from Scotland's key global markets. All Visit Scotland information centers, known as eye centers, will operate as usual until the end of September as part of a phased two-year closure program. Visit Scotland is currently engaging with stakeholders to discuss local arrangements. The way visitors access information is changing, and the sphere of influence has widened far beyond in-person and print media to include social media, influencer marketing, online inspiration, and online booking. Similarly, with almost two-thirds, 64% of international visitors to Scotland booking as part of a package, the role tour tour operators and travel agents can play in helping international visitors plan holidays in Scotland has also become increasingly important.
Richard, um, do you know of any elements or services of um, of Visit Scotland that could be lost in this digitization process? Well, potentially. I mean, I think we all like to see uh, tourist information centres, and I think we would all like to think that they're being used well. But the evidence behind this decision, which I, I have to say I haven't yet seen, uh, I don't have any um, visitor centres like this in, in, in my area. Uh, but uh, if they're not being used, if they're not getting the footfall, and if people's behaviour is changing, then it becomes hard to justify having them. Now, as I say, I haven't seen the evidence to, to know whether or not they're justified in the Visit Scotland are justified in this decision to remove the tourist information centre, but I can certainly recognise a lot of truth in what the the organisation says about people uh, tending to make most of their plans of what they wish to do in Scotland before they arrive. And um, I'm sure that there's a whole range of information and metrics there that we could that, that, that you could look at in terms of numbers of visitors to visitor centres, the numbers of uh, tourist excursions booked, the number of nights of accommodation are booked, and then compare that to what there happens through the website or, 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 or in terms of the overall totals for each of these things. And you would soon work out whether or not it's a good value for money. I mean, for some people, that will be what they gravitate towards. It will be what they want. But I don't think you're going to see a significant... Uh, effect in the number of people coming to Scotland if there's not these 25 uh, centres. But what I think it does show is the real importance of uh, online marketing, of making sure that uh, you've got visitor-friendly uh, websites and facilities in terms of guiding people to where they might want to go, navigating them through the transport system, pointing them in the direction of the companies that can provide the excursions they might want to go to, to help make people aware of the attraction so that they can plan their visits uh, well in advance as uh, people now seem to do. And that was also part of the sh put of putting Scotland in the, the shop window for international tourism, where we're competing against many other uh, scenic uh, countries in, in Europe. You know, we're going to, we have to fight for every single visitor. And uh, maybe the, the arms race in terms of how you fight for those visitor numbers has uh, moved on since the days of the tourist information centre. So it'll be sad to see them go. I know that they'll be there till September, so that will see them through the bulk of the, 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 the this year's tourist season. Um, I think there's probably still a bit of room for discussion around what future support for tourists and visitors look like, looks like before they get to Scotland and also once they're here. But um, I can certainly appreciate the, the sadness that people might feel about this. But uh, if the world's moved on, Scotland needs to as well. And uh, as I say, I, I would hope that this is a decision that has been based on uh, firmly on evidence rather than uh, just as a means of, of trying to save a few pounds. Thank you. Recruitment, um, recruitment of nurses from Global South called a new form of colonialism. The UK and other wealthy countries have been accused of adopting a new form of colonialism and recruiting huge numbers of nurses from poorer nations to fill their own staffing gaps. International nurse nursing leaders said the trend was leading to worse patient care in developing nations, which were not properly compensated for the loss of experienced healthcare staff. Howard Catton, the chief executive of an international council of nurses, said there was real anger among attendee, uh, attenders at a meeting of nursing associations from across Africa and Rwanda this month. He said the African nurse leaders said they were angry with that high income countries were using their economic power to take the nursing workforce they needed from poorer, more fragile countries. These wealthier countries were effectively creating a new form of long-term dependency that hinders the development of health systems in a source country. They described it as a new form of colonialism, he said. World Health Organization rulers, uh, rules are supposed to prevent the poaching of staff from countries with vulnerable healthcare systems. A recruitment from countries in the WHO Red List should not take place without formal agreements. Katzen said, however, that even these often offered only a veneer of ethical responsibility, and there was often little evidence of mutual benefit. He was previously called for stronger. He has previously called for stronger uh, global code of practice on international recruitment. In his 2019 election manifesto, the Conservative government 
promised to boost nurse, nurse numbers in England by 50,000 by 2024, a target met only by recruitment of overseas recruit. Uh, by a target met only by uh, the uh, by uh, because of overseas recruitment sorry there are 8.1 nurses per 1000 people in scotland compared to 7.9 in england richard um should this be a concern for us here in the uk and if so where do we get our nurses instead well yes i think it ought to be a, a concern and we should not be blind to the impact that our choices and policies of, of governments have. Look, I've, I'm in favour of freedom of movement. I believe people should be able to take their skills around the world. I believe that people benefit uh, greatly from the individuals who move around the world benefit greatly from that individually, but also the communities where they share their, their skills benefit from that too. But I don't think we can be blind to the consequences that that can have, particularly where healthcare professionals are concerned. Um, I think that there's a, a real danger of having a, a debilitating impact on some countries where there are the healthcare systems are, are quite fragile and where people who've been trained there could potentially make the greatest contribution. But that's not to say we don't have shortages that need to be filled domestically. And I think that there's always a balance to be struck uh, between uh, immigration to, to, to fill that gap and to allow people to come here to make the best contribution that they can. But fundamentally, we need to be skilling up people here uh, who've been educated here, who live here and who are who are capable who are judged to be have the potential to be capable of filling those uh, skills gaps for ourselves so it's not one or the other but i think we do need to be sensitive to the impact of uh, emigration from countries for people who wish to emigrate here but uh, we also need to be making sure that we have that talent pipeline coming through our own colleges and universities to make sure that there are skills but what i would say is that we're um we do have a particularly cruel uh, policy in place uh, because of the UK government now in terms of uh, imposing uh, limits uh, on in terms of people's earnings. But we're, 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 so we're quite happy to take people to come and work in the care sector here on quite low wages, uh, but not to, in future, allow their families to come over. So we're, we're basically making the value judgment at UK level that, uh, or the UK government is, I'll exclude myself from that, that uh, there are people who are worthy of being able to come here to look after our families <clears throat> they're just not allowed to be able to be with their own families while they're doing so and uh, i think we need a far more honest uh, discussion about the contribution that people make when they come to these shores to to work in our public services to work in the private sector as well but uh, yes what we have is uh, a situation where uh, what we have is a situation where we're, uh, we seem to be acting without heed to the impact that that has uh, on the, the countries where these people are leaving, and uh, that's to be very much regretted. All right, thank you. Uh, for our next story, we're shifting our story over to the US, where a Democrat wins by-election in Alabama after focus on abortion and IVF. An Alabama Democrat who campaigned against the state's near-total ban on abortions has won a special election, by-election, to the state legislature, signaling, the reproductive rights, uh, signaling that reproductive rights is a potent issue for Democratic candidates, even in sovereign states. Marlin Lands won the state House seat on Tuesday, defeating Teddy Powell, a Republican, by 63% to 37%. Lands, a licensed professional counselor, previously ran for the seat in 2022 and lost by 7% to David Cowell. Cole, um, a Republican who re uh, resigned last year after pleading guilty to voter fraud. Lands made Alabama's abortion ban and access to contraception and in vitro fertilization uh, central to her campaign. Speaking openly about her own previous abortion, uh, abortion experience in a TV ad that featured her saying that it was shameful that today's women have fewer freedoms than I had two decades ago. Land said that her win w uh, sent a clear message in the wake of Alabama's near-total abortion ban, which came into effect after the U.S. Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade in 2022. 
In February, there was also a highly controversial state Supreme Court decision that threatened the use of IVF. Land said she would work to overturn Alabama's abortion law, one of the most stringent in the US, which outlaws abortion at any stage of pregnancy with no exceptions for rape or incest. It is also permitted in situations where the life of a pregnant person is in danger. The special election does little to tip the balance of power in conservative Alabama, with Republicans holding a commanding 75-27 to 27 advantage over Democrats in the state house. However, Democrats have hailed the victory as a further sign that restricting access to abortion has proven to be electorally damaging to Republicans. Richard, uh, what does this by-election in the U.S. mean, mean to you? Well, to me, I think it shows that uh, women's reproductive rights uh, clearly matter right across the, the political spectrum. And clearly there's been a, a constituency in US politics that has long opposed uh, the rights that were won in, by women in Roe v. Wade and have uh, you know, been seeking to, to roll that back and had success with the Supreme Court judgment. Uh, but clearly the, the backlash is... Uh, that appears to be building is really quite something, and I think that's entirely understandable that that should be the that should be the case because fundamentally abortion is healthcare, um, you know, and, and it's not you know it is not for any individual, in my view, to make a judgment about why uh, somebody might consider that an abortion is necessary. There's any number of of reasons ranging from the health of the the health of the mother to the circumstances of conception to anything else, and it should simply be a matter of uh, personal choice. And I think that the what we have seen is a, a matter of uh, real overreach. Whatever uh, legal ribbons and bows got tied around the Supreme Court judgment, we've seen a systematic packing of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in recent years by uh, successive Republicans and. Uh, but with any, as in any um, constitutional setup, there's only so far you can push people if uh, what is being done is against the will of the people, and that is, uh, it would seem to be very much the will of uh, the majority that uh, in America that uh, people's republic, uh, reproductive rights should be respected, and uh, I think that there is a there will be a severe electoral price to pay for anyone who stands on a platform which seeks to uh, further restrict that. Thank you. Uh, shifting back to, the, uh, to Scotland, the Scottish government sets out plans for agricultural and rural, uh, rural communities in Holyrood debate. The Scottish Parliament has unanimously passed the Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill at Stage 1 in a debate at Holyrood today. The bill includes new criteria for support which will help farmers and crofters meet more of Scotland's uh, food needs sustainably and farm and croft while working to protect nature. It is the latest update to the Agricultural Reform Root, uh, root Map, a guide to help farmers and crofters prepare for the gradual transition to the new agricultural support framework, which will start in 2027. As part of a move in the new fa uh, framework, changes from 2025 include a new calving interval of 410 days measured on an individual animal basis added to the Scottish Suckler Beef Support Scheme, to help cut emissions intensity and make beef production more efficient. The introduction of the first whole farm plan conditions, which require farmers and crofters to complete two baselining activities from a list of options, including carbon audits, biodiversity audits, soil analysis, and the creation of animal health and welfare plans, or integrated pest management plans. New conditions for peatlands and wetlands uh, under Good Agricultural Environment Conditions, GAEC, six of cross-compliance um, to help protect vital carbon stores. Let me just read that again. New conditions to, for peatlands and wetlands under Good Agricultural Environment Conditions, GAEC, six of cross-compliance to uh, help protect vital carbon stores. Rural Affairs Secretary Mary uh, Gujan said, as we, uh, as we have said for some time, support for farming in Scotland is changing from 2025. Farmers and crofters will need to deliver new things in return for basic payments. 
These changes will allow us to continue to produce high quality foods and to do so in a way that helps us to tackle climate change and enhance nature. As we continue the transition to a new agricultural support framework, we want to make sure that farmers and crofters know exactly what they need to do to prepare for this change. Through our agricultural reform route map, supported with extensive engagement with the sector, we are making sure the sector is kept informed of key updates to future support. It is clear that many farmers and crofters have already begun this journey successfully. I would urge all farmers and crofters to look at, uh, to look at the available information to ensure they are ready for the changes to come. Richard, um, what does it take for an agricultural market to prosper, and is the UK uh, uh, is the uh, and how is the UK doing, and uh, are there any specific countries you think we should take hints from? Um, I'm not going to come up with any countries, but I think an agricultural market needs many things to to prosper. But I think first of all, we need to consider, um, or it's always worth bearing in mind what uh, our agriculture communities actually do for us and what they mean. I mean, they're the, the guardians, the custodians of the of uh, much of uh, the rural landscape. They provide us with our food and our, our food security. And uh, they, they protect, they, they, they are the custodians of, of the environment. So, uh, and also there are many rural communities that depend very much on the viability and the vitality of the farming uh, community around about them, but they also go on to provide jobs in the secondary sector in terms of food production and food processing, where there's a great deal of value added, and where Scotland does extremely well, and has, but also has the potential to do a great deal better. Um, we need to be able to export um, smoothly. That's something that's taken a real dunt with Brexit in terms of the uh, the restrictions that there now are and and the additional paperwork in terms of what we uh, what's needed in order to be able to export that's something that affects the, the fishing industry and the seafood industry as well of course but I think at the back of it you need to have communities that are sustainable um, so that means that uh, the prices that farmers are getting at the farm gate for the produce that they get, that they produce, uh, for the produce that they grow, um, that needs to be fair, that needs to be sustainable. Um, they need to be able to cover the costs of all their inputs. Now, particularly with uh, the, the high energy costs we've had over the last couple of years, that's been a real struggle for farmers because the price of hydrocarbons has pushed up the price of packaging elsewhere in the supply chain it's pushed up the price of fertilizer so um, farmers were often being pushed into the choice of uh, using less fertilizer and having lower yields or uh, spending more on the on the cost of, of production so you know there are a number of variables that farmers financially are not in a good position to take the hit on they need support from the banking sector they also need support from government because uh, it's that funding framework and that stable policy framework and that clarity about what we're expecting from our rural communities that allows them to plan ahead and to survive and thrive. But what helps them prosper is having that stability and also allowing them to take advantage of uh, new technologies in the sector, like uh, and also you know developing uh, you know their own energy, whether that's. Uh, adopting wind power or whether it's a greater use of the hydrogen economy as that develops because if you can reduce the cost of inputs uh, you significantly reduce the cost of outputs and it means that in turn you're not only putting less financial pressure on farmers and the communities that they help to support and the people who live in those communities and the public services round about that which are also a key element it means that you're also putting less stress on the environment as well so there's a, a whole basket of things that need to be firing properly in the in the policy framework around the rural communities which we all of us ultimately rely on thank you uh, for our next story the scottish government housing bill has been published new legislation which aims to keep people in their homes and help prevent homelessness has been published the housing scotland bill will introduce an act uh, an ask and act duty on social landlords and bodies such as health boards and the police to ask about a person's housing situation and act to avoid them becoming homeless wherever possible it also reforms provision for people threatened with homelessness up to six months ahead and includes provisions for tenants experiencing domestic abuse. 
The bill will outline proposals for a new deal for tenants, a key part of the Butte House agreement between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Green Party. Proposals include uh, long-term rent controls for private tenancies, new rights to keep pets, decorate rented homes, and stronger protection against eviction. Housing Minister Paul McLennan and Tenants Rights Minister Patrick Harvey will lead the bill's passage through Parliament. Mr McLennan said the following. Scotland already has the strongest rights in the UK for people who uh, become homeless, but nobody should have to experience the trauma and disruption of losing their home. Early action, through the kind of measures included in the housing bill, results in fewer people reaching the point of housing crisis. It also means people facing homelessness have more choice and control over where to live, helping them to maintain relationships in their community and stay in work. Mr. Harvey said the fall added the following, a fairer, well-regulated, rented sector in a good, um, is good for both tenants and landlords. Tenants benefit from improved conditions and security, while good, responsible landlords will thrive when their good practice is recognized by regulation. Richard, uh, in the interest of time, we'll try to keep this short, um, but is the Scottish government doing everything in its power for homelessness and homeless people? I think by and large it, it is. I mean, I'm sure people can always come up with more, and certainly I would like to see us, the Scottish government building more houses, but that's something that's made uh, difficult uh, when it's having its capital budget cut by 10% over the next five years by the UK government. But I think as well as uh, increasing the size of the housing supply uh, with a range of different tenures, uh, I think there are some other issues round about tenancies uh, that this bill seems to be trying to tackle about uh, longer term rent controls in terms of managing the market, in terms of uh, clarifying tenants' rights, in terms of giving them greater sovereignty, if you like, over the the, the places in which they live, whether that's uh, the right to keep a pet or the right to... <coughs> decorate um so i think and also strengthening uh, uh putting in on a firmer legislative footing the, uh, the 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 provisions that were put in place during the pandemic to uh protect against uh, uh, evictions um so i think there's a range of things that uh, are in this uh, housing bill which sound like they are they are good and useful steps forward but uh, could could the scottish government be doing more or any government could always be doing more because i think that the housing is one of the real political problems of our our generation mm -hmm. and it's one that deserves a great deal more attention than uh, any government has been able to give it given the distractions of over the last few years of brexit and pandemics and so on thank you uh, our next story is uh, 10.5 billion pounds of Scot uh, from Scottish government funding for care experienced children at uh, sorry that was a million if I said a billion that's a mistake on my part 10.5 million pounds from uh, of Scottish government funding for care experienced children and young people care experienced children and young people will receive further support to improve attainment attendance and well-being throughout their education and beyond the Scottish government will provide 10.5 million pounds to be shared by local authorities across Scotland through the care experienced children and young people fund Launched in 2018, the funding is provided to local authorities and aims to improve the educational outcomes for care-experienced children and young people, supported by the strategic goals of the uh, uh, Promise and the Scottish Attainment Challenge. The fund has so far provided more than £60 million uh, pounds to deliver initiatives such as mentoring uh, programs and out-of-school support. First Minister Hamza Youssef said, I am fully committed to keeping the promise every single child should grow up loved, safe, supported, and respected, as well as being given every opportunity to flourish and reach their full potential. Supporting care experienced young people includes helping them to continue or re-enter education, and the care experienced children and young people fund plays a vital role in delivering additional support to improve educational outcomes. We know it is making a real difference as the latest figures show more care experienced children and young people are staying in school for longer and achieving higher qualifications. Improving outcomes for care experienced young people requires a truly national effort and the Scottish Government will continue to work with uh, local authorities, schools and others to ensure that all young people in Scotland can meet their full potential. Richard, what are your thoughts on the uh, care bill being announced here? 
Uh, I think this additional ten point five million pounds worth of uh, support is uh, extraordinarily welcome. Um, I think um, I remember when I was a, a local authority councillor in, in Aberdeenshire, uh, we had the, the message uh, drilled into us about the, the role that we had as corporate parents for many uh, children and young people who were in the various forms of, of care that the local authority provided. And I think it's important to note that um, for so many young people in that situation, they've got enormous potential, but they've often gone through some pretty tough and challenging uh, uh, life experiences that belie their, their young years. So I think that uh, <clears throat> the, it's incumbent on government, whether that's local government or national government, to, and all of us who have a responsibility as collective corporate parents, if you like, for, for these youngsters to, uh, for care experienced youngsters to give them the best start in life that they've been deprived of by their, their circumstances, but to give them the best uh, chances in life that they can from where they start and with the support that is available. Obviously, 10.5 million can give a great deal of support in terms of uh, trying to provide mentorship, I think, is one of the initiatives here, but anything that can basically lift sights and uh, encourage and motivate and help open doors and uh, help to get help to get these care experienced young people off, as I say, to the, the best possible start in their, their, their adult life and to, to try and level the playing field and equalise things a bit for them to, to overcome whatever difficulties that they've, that they've already faced. Thank you. For our last story, the Scottish Parliament debates the economic impact of Scotland's renewable energy. In the Scottish Parliament today, Audrey, uh, Audrey Nicole MSP led a debate on the recent Fraser of Allander Institute report, the economic impact of Scotland's renewables energy sector 2023 update. Commissioned by Scottish Renewables, the report showed that Scotland's renewable energy industry and its supply chain supported more than 42,000 full-time equivalent jobs in 2021, with the industry also um, also supporting over 10.1 billion pounds, this time billion was correct, of output. As the MSP for Aberdeen South and North uh, Kincar uh, Kincardine, uh, an area of the forefront of Scotland's just transition, Audrey Nicole highlighted the challenge of striking the right balance between a declining fossil fuel sector and a growing renewable fo uh, renewables footprint, and how vital this is to the northeast. Speaking in the chamber, Audrey Nicole MSP said, "Renewable energy uh, generation is the foundation of any net zero economy, and in Scotland, renewable technologies, onshore and offshore wind, marine renewables, and heat pumps play a key role in reducing our carbon footprint and supporting our future energy security." Scotland has set ambitious targets, and challenges exist in delivering those ambitions. But today is a time, I hope, to acknowledge the positive impact the renewable sector is having on jobs and economic output in Scotland. Richard, uh, what do you think of the pro uh, process on uh, progress on renewables made here in Scotland and how does it compare with the rest of the UK? Well, Scotland's well ahead, not just of the UK, but <clears throat> most other parts of Europe at present. We've got uh, enormous potential in uh, tidal power, um, largely untapped. We're currently the world leaders in terms of installed capacity uh, per capita there. But uh, clearly the, the, the really exciting bit at the moment is the potential for floating offshore wind. Um, the Scotland uh, programme will see uh, potentially 25 gigawatts of uh, power uh, being harvested from uh, floating offshore wind off of the, the coastline of, of, of Scotland. To put that in context, that's about five times uh, our current uh, domestic uh, electricity usage. Now, of course, as we move to decarbonise uh, heat, as we move to decarbonise industrial processes and move to decarbonise transport with electrification of railways and, you know, vehicles where hydrogen isn't appropriate and um, then a great deal of that 25 gigawatts will be uh, absorbed domestically but we still have the an enormous potential to meet not just our own energy demands but also the energy demands of uh, other parts of the uk of which we're currently a part but also in terms of uh, what we can do not just with electricity exports to europe ultimately but also hydrogen exports across the 
the North Sea. So, you know, we're in a tremendously advantageous position with uh, the second wave of energy. And, uh, you know, we're in, we're in a good place. And if we take the right political decisions round about mm. that, one of which I would argue is independence, uh, then we can do even better. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was the Gordon SNP MP, uh, Richard Thompson, also a shadow spokesperson for uh, international trade, Northern Ireland and Wales. Quite a list there. Uh, I, was, I have to double check my page like four times while reading it. Um, that is it for this evening. And before I go, I just want to remind you that here at Broadcasting Scotland, we depend on the generosity of our supporters. Our programs will always be free to view. However, if you can afford £5 a month, please consider becoming a Broadcasting Scotland supporter. To everyone who has donated and to everyone who has signed up to make a regular monthly payment, thank you very much. Our focus must now move to securing the future of independent broadcasting for Scotland by growing our subscriber base and regular funding. Thanks again to our guest today. Thank you, Richard Thompson. Goodbye. And goodbye to our viewer as well.